Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, President Obama visits the Valley to talk about housing. We'll hear about a major initiative to communicate the dangers of heroin use in Arizona, and we'll get caught up on issues from the southern part of the state. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. President Barack Obama was in Phoenix today to talk about the recovering housing market. The president spoke at Central High School and announced a cut in mortgage insurance premiums on FHA loans. The president emphasized that the move is intended to help serious home buyers who can afford to buy a home. So I want to be clear, if you're looking to take advantage of these lower rates, uh, that's great. On the other hand, don't buy something you can't afford. You're, you're going to be out of luck. The, these rates are for responsible buyers. We're not going down the road again of, of financing folks buying things they can't afford. We're going to be cracking down on that. We put in in place tough rules on Wall Street, and we created a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And, and we're really policing irresponsible lenders, luring folks into buying stuff they can't afford. So the bottom line is that we don't think there's anything wrong with pursuing a profit, but we want to make clear the days of making bad bets on the back of taxpayer money and then getting bailed out afterwards, we're not going back to that. We, we've, we've worked too hard. And everything we've done to heal the housing markets, you know, we, we want to preserve. But we do want to make sure that the housing market is strong and that responsible homeowners can get a good deal. And here now to talk about the president's plan and how it could impact the local housing market is Mike Orr, director of the Center for Real Estate Theory and Practice at ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business. Good to see you again. Good evening. What exactly did the president propose? Uh, well, the main thing is this reduction in mortgage insurance, which um, if you go back five years, it was down at 0.5%. Uh, so it's actually increased a lot over the last few years as FHA wanted to insure themselves against um, bad debt. It's risen to 1.35 and uh, Obama was talking about taking it down back down to 0.85. Uh, so that's quite a significant reduction. So from 1.35 to 0.85, cutting mortgage insurance could affect a couple hundred thousand folks? Uh, the White House estimate is about 250,000 extra buyers with FHA loans over the next three years. But that's for the whole country, of course. Right, right. Uh, I mean, I think this is a step in the right direction, but it's not a huge thing. You know, it's not going to make a dramatic difference to the market. As far as uh, f this particular deal, though, is this first time buyers only? Is it uh, existing homeowners can refinance? How does that work? It's for people who take out FHA loans. So it doesn't have to be a first time home buyer and you can refinance. Most FHA loans go to people who are taking out a purchase loan rather than a refi, but there's nothing stopping anybody from applying. Uh, the point However, is if you've got a good rate at the moment, do you really want to go through all the bother of refining mm -hmm. just to lower your mortgage insurance? It may not be worthwhile. And the typical buyer saves what nine hundred some odd dollars uh, a year. A year. Yeah. So probably seventy-five a month uh, compared with uh, before this introduction. So it will help. It will make uh, buying a home a little bit more attractive. And uh, two hundred and fifty thousand extra over the next three years is about one and a half percent increase in volume. So it's something, but it's not something you'd notice. I, I know. I, I, okay, and I know that the president's doing this, and the concern out there is still that creditworthy borrowers yeah. are they're still being shut out. Are they still being shut out? And if so, why? Well, they're still being shut out from conventional loans. Uh, actually, FHA loans it's easier to qualify for. It, it, before we go further, define an FHA loan. A FHA loan is basically insured uh, by uh, the government. Uh, the, the loan is written by a commercial bank, but it's insured by the government if it follows certain guidelines. That means if you fail to pay it, the bank is basically bailed out by the government because they say, OK, this house is going back to you and HUD has to sell it mm -hmm. to get to uh, get the money. It, so it's, it gets foreclosed the same way. Uh, but um, it's basically designed to make things affordable for people who are uh, lower incomes but creditworthy. And it's very popular with first-time home buyers. 
Uh, and, and folks, as we mentioned before, these creditworthy borrowers have been shut out. Why? Well, everybody is very nervous about lending to people with poor credit because of what happened in 2007, 8, 9. And um, so we've swung from credit being very, very loose to being very, very tight. And now we're trying to sort of gradually shift it back to the middle position where the right people get loans and the wrong people don't. And that, according to the president's speech that we've just heard, he wants to make sure that you realize not something to be abused. We're not going all the way back to the, <laughs> the, the, that bad situation. But I think everybody else thinks that we are a little bit too strict, even the lenders themselves you know, are pushing it a little bit back towards um, the middle position. Uh, is there a move out there to try and cut red tape for qualified borrowers? I'd like there to be one. Um, it's actually... Um, it gets talked about all the time, but I think if you go through a loan application, you still find you have to do a lot of work, a lot of documentation, much of which you will probably think is unnecessary. Uh, and if that can be reduced, that would help everybody, I think. Well, uh, and I think uh, most people realize that those restrictions are in place because of the bad loans in the mm -hmm. past. Something like this, is there a risk now that we're going to start seeing more bad loans? I think l memories are too short, uh, too long to you know, go back to the bad old days. Um, at the moment, we've still got a little bit too much carefulness. You know, where you can no longer get away with telling lots of lies on your mortgage application and no evidence to back it up. Now you've got to have evidence to back it up, but the, you actually want you know, a second or a third copy of something to prove what was right. on there. And it goes a little bit, it gets to the point where it takes you so much effort to get the loan that you think, this is too hard, I'm going to stop and give up and come back next year. You must really want the house then also. You've either got to want the house or you really need that refinance. So uh, the banks are not doing as much business as they would like. Uh, mortgage applications are pretty low level, so they've got some incentive to start getting the whole thing turning over a little faster. And we've talked about this before, first-time buyers out there, they're just not buying for a variety of yep. reasons. The millennials especially just aren't getting into the housing market. Does something like this Help. It helps. It's not a breakthrough move, though. I just I think because the president said it, it seems like it's really significant, and it's not. I think everybody thinks it's a good idea. I haven't heard anybody say a bad thing about it, but it's not going to make a big noticeable difference. I'm actually expecting more demand this year than last year because those millennials are all a year older. They're all a little bit closer to having kids, deciding to put some roots down. Plus, we have. All of those people who got foreclosed in 2008 coming out of their penalty box phase uh -huh. and are able to apply for conventional loans we'll again. We'll see if we see some more uh, signs in the ground. You certainly don't see many signs in the ground right now. There's not much uh, supply, and that's actually... I'm quite glad that the president come, didn't come up with a bigger scheme because if we really boosted d d demand right now, it could overwhelm supply, and we have another... Uh, dramatic increase in uh, pricing, bidding wars, and all those things we had to put up with three years ago. All right. Well, it's good to have you here. Thanks for joining. Good it's to see you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. At the entrance of Bullhead City's Community Park on State Route 95 is a marker honoring Northeastern Arizona's vital relationship with the Colorado River. For nearly 30 years in the mid-1800s, commercial steamships served the mining communities of Northern Arizona, hauling supplies from as far down river as Yuma. Cargo was unloaded at nearby Hardyville, often returning downstream with barge loads of local ore. Bull's Head Rock, from which Bullhead City derived its name, was located just upstream. The escarpment was used as a navigation marker and the point where Mojave Indians forded the river. Bull's Head Rock was submerged in 1953 with the building of Davis Dam. Today, the Colorado is still Bullhead City's lifeblood. Jet skis have replaced the steamships, and Laughlin, Nevada's casinos just across the river have replaced the mines, mining tourist wallets instead of the ore from the mountains. Next Tuesday, television stations in Phoenix, Tucson, and Yuma, along with most of the state's radio stations, will air a 30-minute investigative report titled Hooked, Tracking Heroin's Hold on Arizona.
And it is literally like the devil. You think you can move away from it? It's gonna follow you no matter how far away you go. Heroin is an absolute epidemic. Maricopa County is the distribution hub for the Sinaloa cartel's heroin market in the United States. It's a drug that devastates an entire society. The only two outcomes of, of heroin are prison and death. The program is produced by advanced journalism students at the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And joining us now to talk more about this statewide effort is Art Brooks. And he is the uh, uh, president and CEO of the Arizona Broadcasters Association. Jackie Petchel, a Cronkite professor and Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter and editor who oversaw the production of the program. And Doug Coleman, special agent in charge of the Phoenix Field Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration. Good to have you all here. Good Thanks so much for joining you. us. Thank you. All right, let's get started with you. What exactly is going to be shown statewide on radio and TV? A half hour outstanding production from the Cronkite School. And uh, it's been a great partnership between the ABA and the Cronkite School. But we have 100% of all of the TV stations in the state, 33 stations committed to air the program, same time, same day. And we have, as of right now, we have 93 radio stations, same time, same day. Difficult getting all these folks on board? You think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Noah's Ark action going uh, on here. It's, it's interesting. But, you know, it just shows that there, when there's a vital crisis going on in your communities around the state, um, local broadcasters step up. And as far as the ASU students, the journalism students stepping up, talk to us about what the goal was and what the results were. Well, the goal, of course, was to produce first a, a top-notch production that would be worthy of being aired on every uh, broadcast in Arizona. But beyond that, um, beyond the actual work, I mean, the goal of any public university, of course, is to educate a new generation of students. And in this case, I think not only were they learning their craft, but they were involved in a really important social issue. And so they're learning more than journalism. They're learning more than how to produce a documentary. They're learning about um, an issue that's really important in their community. And a lot of the trending ages of addicts are, are not that much different than some students. And I think it's a really important thing for them to be exposed to. So let's talk about that. What is heroin's hold on Arizona? You know, heroin's hold is, is really a result of a, a, an increased use of prescription drugs and a prescription drug abuse by young people in this country. Prescription drugs have a, a, a clean look about them because they're given by a doctor. So kids will get these drugs thinking that it's okay because it came from a doctor and it's in mom and dad's medicine cabinet. They'll t steal them, take them to get high. Problem with this is prescription drugs, the most of the ones that are abused are opiate based. Opium and heroin, same thing. So what ends up happening is the kids get addicted to these drugs, pretty soon they can't afford the pills anymore and they have to switch to street heroin. Oh my goodness, okay, and, and then you're seeing that among younger and younger folks? Younger and younger because they're getting, they're having the farm parties where they throw the drugs, the, all the drugs that they stole from mom and dad into a, into a little uh, uh, jar and then they take them when they get there. So these kids are taking these drugs thinking that they're okay because they came from a doctor mm -hmm. and the next thing you know we have a generation of heroin addicts. All right, when you, when you hear about an issue like this, there are a lot of issues out there right. in Arizona affecting right. a lot of folks. How do you decide which one is worth this kind of effort? You know, almost seven years ago in 2008, we did a program called Crystal Darkness, you know, which was an anti-meth program. And that was the first time anything had ever been done like that in the country. Markets coming together, TV and radio markets together to do something same time, same day. So it, 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 it's got to be something to the extent of what Doug just explained. It's a crisis level and, and kids are dying and, uh, and, and crime rate is high. So I think the broadcasters take a look at that and assess that and think we need to do something. We have the ability to step into this and really make a difference and save some lives. And as far as the students are concerned, talk about getting the stories together, getting the investigative teams together. What was, how many, how many professors, how much faculty, how many students were involved? Um, well, you know, there probably were at least 50 to 70 students that were involved, some of them way more than others. Um, you know, there was a core group of probably 30 who were like the heavy lifters. Um, there probably was about nine or so faculty involved in various aspects of it. Um, it was a big commitment to the project and, um, you know, we just basically told the students, go out, find it, talk, find addicts, talk to people. And um, they, 
measured up every step of the way, I have to say. And this was a semester-long project, correct? We, 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 had, we worked on it basically for less than 16 weeks. Interesting. Um, when you saw the program, uh, before you saw the program, what did you hope would be emphasized? And now that we're going to see the program, what has been emphasized? You know, it, it, it hits everything it needs to hit, and I think it's the, a powerful message that we have to send. The program's about saving lives, and when people see this, we're going to save lives behind this. If we can save one kid from going down that path, then everything, all the work that everybody's done has made the entire thing work, worth it. And, and you mentioned the, the prescription drug, uh, that aspect of it. I mean, it, how, it, is that going to change? I mean, how do you change something like that? Because it is out there, and it, do, it, does, it becomes part of the dynamic. Yeah, you know, the prescription drug thing, it has to be changed by education, right? We're targeting these th programs like this. We're targeting these young kids to make them realize just because it comes from a doctor and just because it's sitting in mom and dad's medicine cabinet doesn't mean it's okay to use outside of the way your doctor tells you to use it. And that's what this program emphasizes that, hey, you go down this road, here's what the result could be, and the, the program hits it perfectly. As far as what you want to see from this particular effort, again, the goals, obviously, communication, education, it's got to be out there, but, uh, I mean, this is, this is a big issue, and it's been, a, heroin is not new. It's not going to cure the issue, but what it's going to do is stimulate the conversation and the education. And I think the other thing it'll do, we have a call center related to this. Uh, from the time the first broadcast goes with, on the Spanish side at 5 o'clock, the general market will air it at 6.30. And we have a call center set up right here at Channel 8 in the, in the main studio. 100 phones, 100 call takers, all from the treatment recovery industry. And they're going to be able to answer a lot of questions. And I think we'll know pretty quickly after that broadcast or during that broadcast the need and, and the identification of what is going on, because because that phone bank will fill up and probably stay filled up throughout the three or four hours it'll be open. And these are for folks who want counseling, just more information, these sorts of things? They want access. We may, we may even have some 911 type calls. We may have some suicide calls. We don't know right now, but we have a pretty good idea, a pretty good feel mm -hmm for what kind of calls we're going to get. Did you have a pretty good idea or a pretty good feel on what you were going to get? I mean, obviously there's a plan, the, the plan is put in place, and you get the results. Were you surprised by anything? Did you learn anything? Um, well, of course, I, I learned a lot, um, mostly about the ability for our students to really stretch themselves. Sadly, I've been doing this a long time and nothing really surprises me, but I think that um, what was really surprising to me were the number of addicts that we were able to reach relatively easily. And when I say that, um, people who are willing to talk about their experiences and people as well in law enforcement who are willing to talk about the problem. And I think, I wasn't surprised, but I'm extremely pleased with the project, not its topic, but its result because I think if there's one thing a public university should be doing, and I don't know that any public university has tried to do something like this before, it's to engage in public service as part of the education project uh, process. And I think that's what these students did. I, it, I find that's interesting you saying people were as open as they were. Are we, as a society, heroin has been around for a long time and we've heard about it as being a problem for a long time. Is society changing its views on that? Are they more? Are people more open about this? What are you seeing out there? You know, I think that the, the reason this is so important is is that heroin's always been around, but heroin was always a, a specific subset of people that used it, and we didn't see a lot of heroin crossover into younger generation. And with the the rise in the prescription drug abuse, now we're seeing a crossover of heroin use into these young kids. Heroin's a dirty, nasty drug. You inject it, you you smoke it. It's a horrible drug. And historically, we didn't see that in getting into the young people so much. But with that crossover between the, the prescription drugs and the opiate addiction related to that, going into the, to the heroin abuse, we're seeing it spread into a whole different demographic than we've ever seen before. All right. Art, real quickly, how before we go, give us the particulars again. When's it going to show? How long is it going to air? Tuesday evening, January 13th, uh, Spanish version, television, uh, 5 to 5.30. The rest of the stations in the state will go 6.30 to 7.00 and the radio broadcast will join in at 6.30 to 7 p.m. Will there be a way to see this if you miss it the first time around? Online, something yes. like that? Yes, uh, it'll be posted on the Cronkite School website for download, 
and uh, and there will be ways to to access that program. And don't forget the call center and the numbers will be in in the program that that evening. All right, yes. very good. Good to have you all here, and congratulations here. on this project. Thank you. Uh, Ted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. Once a month, we present Southern Exposure, a chance to get caught up on issues from south of the Gila River. And here now to bring us up to date is Tucson Weekly senior writer, Jim Ninsel. Good to see you again. Great to be here, Ted. All right, uh, we don't have a heck of a lot of time this go around, but what we've been talking about and what we've been hearing about a lot lately is ethnic studies program down at the Tucson Unified School District. It sounds like the new superintendent, Diane Douglas, is taking a different tact than the old. So what's going on? Well, we don't know yet because uh, we haven't heard from Diane Douglas herself, but uh, this is these ethnic studies classes that uh, the state legislature passed a law to try to ban uh, several years ago, and it dismantled an existing program down in Tucson, uh, Mexican American Studies program that was uh, fairly successful in, in helping kids get uh, engaged in academics and, and go on to college, uh, but it also had some controversial elements that state lawmakers didn't like, so they passed this law saying you can't uh, teach certain uh, sorts of subjects to children, which I think if you're trying to tell people they aren't oppressed, the best thing to do is not to pass a law telling them they can't learn certain things. But uh, that aside, uh, they've reconstituted some of these programs as part of a federal uh, lawsuit, uh, desegregation lawsuit that goes back decades. So they still need to include some of these ethnic studies programs into their uh, curriculum. Uh, and apparently John Hoopenthal got a look at some of the new things that they were teaching in these. He was very unhappy about some Rage Against the Machine lyrics. Yes, Evidently, and like some hip-hop courses, I so, think, as yeah, well. Yeah, apparently that's uh, going to really turn the kids to a criminal lifestyle or something. So, so. we said that uh, the district has until March to kill us, to get rid of all this stuff, or else they lose, what, 10% of funding or something along those lines. But Diane Douglas now is the superintendent, and we really don't know if she's going to follow through on something like that. We don't know. Uh, he, John Hoopenthal did this on his last day in office, which is a heck of a way to go out the door. And then uh, Diane Douglas has taken over. H.T. Sanchez, the superintendent at TUSD, the new superintendent, says that he does support these classes. He does not want to see them uh, changed. And he met with Diane Douglas uh, this week and uh, says that it was a very productive meeting and he doesn't expect her to take the same tack as John Hoopenthal. But uh, it's a wait and see at this point. Are Tucson residents in general supportive of the Ethnic Studies program or do they have problems as well? I think the vast majority of them are fairly indifferent, honestly, to the program. They're, they're, the programs certainly have their supporters out there, and they have uh, some very fierce critics. But uh, I, I would say that the vast majority of people don't really care much one way or the other. They're not that engaged in the, in the debate. We should mention Martha McSally. Uh, since last we've spoken, she is now officially the representative down there in Congress. And uh, immediate high profile. I mean, she's on a subcommittee for Homeland Security. It sounds like they want to get her out there and exposed quickly. I think that's true. I think uh, she was one of the top recruits for the Republicans in this last election round. Uh, they definitely want her to achieve a, a national profile. You saw her on Fox News uh, last Sunday morning talking with Chris Wallace. And I think we'll see a lot of Martha on the national stage uh, on those kinds of programs. And with that in mind, though, is that considered a vulnerable seat, A, and B, who would be a Democrat that could be competition for her? There's a lot of talk about what Democrats might run, and you could have a very uh, you know, crowded primary uh, trying to find a candidate. Uh, you know, we, we could have uh, a dozen candidates. I, I don't think it'll be that large, but there's a lot of people out there who would like to do it. They're going to have to raise a lot of money, because one thing that Martha McSally was very good at was raising money. She outraised Ron Barber in every reporting cycle, uh, and I, I think over $3 million she was able to raise. So whoever goes up against 
Westminster is going to have to have the ability to raise that kind of money. And, and we'll see what happens with a primary, but a bruising primary among Democrats isn't going to help a candidate move on to challenge Martha in the general. And you mentioned uh, Ron Barber again. Uh, this is four years ago today. Uh, the shootings down there in Tucson, correct? Yeah, very terrible day in Tucson, and the and the the wounds still cut very deeply for a lot of people who were closely affected by that. We have a story in the Weekly uh, today coming out. Your folks can read it online, but it's uh, by Ross Zimmerman, whose son Gabe Zimmerman was uh, one of the six people killed in that mass shooting, and Gabe was uh, an assistant to uh, Gabby Gifford's uh, constituent uh, services guy, and and he was one of the people killed. Uh, he was an avid outdoorsman. They have a uh, trail named for him uh, down in Tucson. And his father, Ross, talks about, you know, the, what it ha losing his son, what it means to him today, but also how proud he is about the uh, way that he's been honored, and, and there's a big uh, thing going on in Tucson this weekend called Beyond. Uh, people are getting outdoors, they're they're exercising, they're doing things in, in honor of Gabe and, and the others we lost that day. So that's a big deal. There's a big concert. Ron Barber uh, has a group called the, uh, the Fund for Civility, Respect, and Understanding, which is designed to raise money to help with bullying programs, anti-bullying programs, mm -hmm. and uh, also for mental health programs, and, and they're having a big fundraising concert with Ozo Motley and with uh, Joey Burns of Calexico and some others going to be performing at Hotel Congress and uh, the Rialto Theater down there. So a lot going on to kind of commemorate and remember. Real quickly, before we go, are, are there plans for a permanent memorial to the shooting? Yes, that's underway as well. And, and there's, it's, it sounds like it could be a pretty hefty price tag. They're talking $2 million for this uh, revamp of one of our downtown parks where our city hall is and our county headquarters are and the old Pima County Courthouse, which you might be familiar with, the big pink dome in the downtown area. That's all where the memorial's going to go, and they're working on that. And design teams are supposed to be selected early next year. All right. Jim, good to see you. Always Thanks a pleasure, up. Ted. Yeah, good to see you. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it is the Journalist's Roundtable. We'll discuss Governor Ducey's inauguration speech and what to expect from his State of the State address and budget proposal set for next week. That's Friday on the Journalist's Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.